Everyone, thank you so much for bearing with us while we coordinate the tech. You've all been on the other side of this, so you know what it's like. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Penny Balkenbach. I'm the executive director and chief curator at the Association for Public Art in Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us for this part of our speaker series, Insights the Future of Public Art. This year, the association celebrates its 150th anniversary. We are the nation's first private nonprofit organization dedicated to the integration of public art and urban design. And the speaker series is looking at the future of public art through different lenses. Earlier, we heard from the Taddy family of conservators, then from curator Valerie Castle Oliver, and for Today's presentation, we'll hear from a very accomplished artist working in challenging public spaces. And so I am excited to introduce you to Karen Olivier. Karen creates sculptures, installations, and public art. And her work typically interrogates the past, but is also while also seeking out contemporary narratives. Karen's a professor of sculpture at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. She's recently been working on two memorials for Philadelphia. One commemorates Dinah, a formerly enslaved woman who lived at the Stenton House in Philadelphia. And uh, the other at the Bethel Burial Burying Ground Historic Memorial that will honor 19th century Black Philadelphians buried beneath a site that for many years had been used as a playground in Queens Village. She's created temporary installations with Monument Lab and Creative Time and has received numerous awards, fellowships, grants, um, including the very competitive and coveted uh, Rome Prize for residents at the American Academy in Rome. I think she works a bit like an archaeologist, scratching the surface, then digging and digging deeper to discover things that we may not know about a site or the people who, who inhabited it. We've asked her to discuss the major themes in her work, the challenges and responsibilities of working in the public realm, and the sources of inspiration that have shaped her as an artist. Karen has great news about a major large scale permanent installation that was made official yesterday in the New York Times. And I'll leave that to her to mention it. Um, and I wanted to say that during the presentation, you can submit any questions into the Q&A and we'll try our best to respond at the end. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome friend Karen Olivier coming to us from Philadelphia, although this morning she was in New York City. Karen, take it. Thank you. It's great to have, to have you all here. Um, I think we'll just get to it. Is everything looking good, folks? Thumbs up? I'll assume it's a yes. Okay, so I wanna start with the 16th century talking statues of Rome. A friend kind of in passing just mentioned them to me and it felt like a revelation. Anonymous messages were attached to this group of six statues. This is the original one named Pasquino and the messages left by the public kind of reinvented these statues as sites of protest, political dissent for critique and commentary on the religious and political authorities at the time. The effigies became the spokespeople of Rome. At times responses were po posted between statues creating this kind of ongoing dialogue between multiple histories and shifting authors. The statuary became active, mutable and contemporary. Here's another iteration. Um, in this one, Pasquino has been adorned with this placard that reads, well, the translation is, it is no longer the moment to obey. Defend your destiny with strength. Even at the expense of dying, don't let yourself be treated like a puppet. So I was thinking about that. I was thinking about these talking statues and how they've they informed my first, the first project I'm gonna share. 
So in 2016, I was invited by Mural Arts and Monument Lab to participate in the citywide exhibition. And the artists were charged with the question, you know, what is the appropriate monument for the city of Philadelphia? And we were asked to create prototypes. And I was intrigued by two monuments in historic Vernon Park, which is, you know, a couple blocks away from my home. So this monument is dedicated to Francis Daniel Pistorius. He was an early German settler in the neighborhood known as, known as Germantown. And he led the first Quaker protests against slavery in 1688. So that's, you know, almost 200 years before it was abolished. I found in my research, I found out that during World War I and II, the monument was concealed, was boxed over. The, the thought was that the look and the feel wasn't American enough. It was actually too Germanic. Um, I was also intrigued with this other monument in the park, the, the Battle of Germantown Memorial, which commemorates an American Revolutionary War battle um, led by George Washington. I was interested in the fact that it celebrates a failed battle, like we, which all then speaks about power and privilege and access, like who gets to have a monument, who is deemed worthy. You know, so I was interested in this immigrant, Francis Pistorius, who fought for the freedom of, you know, Blacks of slaves in this country, but wasn't considered um, American enough, say, to continually honor. Um, and Washington, who fought for America's liberation from British rule while owning slaves. So I was thinking, you know, about the paradox and the complexity, complexity, the co complexity and the disparate histories that make up America. You know, so I decided I really want to use that history in my intervention. So I decided to shroud the Battle of Germantown Memorial in a mirrored surface and in effect boxing it up you know, the way the Pastorius Monument has, had been in years past. And I really hope that physical concealment with this reflective surface would allow the monument to feel expansive and accessible, maybe less intimidating than its kind of colossal nature and material weightiness usually permit. And I was interested too in invisibility, you know, depending on your location where you enter the park, it would seem to disappear. Um, and I wanted this piece to definitely be in direct engagement with the Confederate monument debate that I think is still pretty alive in this country. And this piece was installed actually a week after the attack that took place in Charlottesville, which I'm sure you all remember where peaceful protesters were, were run down by a driver from the neo-Nazi white supremacist rally. You know, and I was also interested in kind of what invisibility reveals, you know, what does invisibility bring to the fore? What does it challenge, you know? What does it suggest about notions of access and privilege? You know, if we ch and then I started to think about okay, something that's been hidden or we don't see. Once you spotlight it, once you spotlight what was hidden now, like how does that shift the legacy and the future of the status quo? You know, it's a neighborhood park, and I was thinking, you know, of these kind of monolithic, imposing, impenetrable sculptures, and how, you know, most parkgoers, including myself, have perhaps, you know from a maybe approach these from like maybe a physical and metaphoric distance, maybe feeling as though these monuments have little relevance or relationship to their to their lived experience. Maybe it's someone else's history. But I also think about how if you pass by something over and over again, you know, maybe you kind of only register it kind of marginally after those repeat encounters. So I was thinking, what can I do to make this the familiar or what's kind of what we don't see anymore, maybe familiar, make, make it strange or uncanny. And, I, and, and I'm often in the work trying to engage with multiple histories to kind of reveal the fragmentary nature in which we actually learn about the past. You know, there's the impossibility of a universal or, or an objective history. You know, so I hope to point to the fact that, you know, historical narratives can be conflicting. You know, our present is grounded in these innumerable histories and they will continue to shift over time as new knowledge is unearthed. You know, I don't, I don't usually show this image. Um, and I think, um, I think I don't because it, it feels frightening. It's, there's something very frightening about it. I don't know if it calls to mind like the coldness associated with say fascist monuments and architecture, but I think it's useful here to ponder in this case, how the change of season from summer to late fall and the gray sky how drastically it changed like the tenor and feel and the reading of the monument. You know, I, I think often about how context really matters and how that can play such a significant role in how we interpret artworks, be it in museums, be them in the, in the public realm. You know, but more optimistically, I was thinking, you know, I was trying to reimagine this monument where you can see the world above, behind, before you, under you, directly before you. And I was thinking, what would it do to allow viewers to have like these access to different axes, 
to engage the work, kind of disrupt the verticality we often associate with, with monuments, you know, allow it to really be this kind of living, breathing entity. And I was thinking too about what is it to kind of rid the monument of its, um, of the singular perspective, which the singular perspective is falsely supposed to represent a universal, which we know is false. Um, you know, so I was thinking too about, uh, well, I'll talk about that later, but um, an amazing thing happened. Trapita Mason, who is, was the poet laureate, I think in 2020 and a Germantown resident and a historian, I went to an event and it was pretty incredible to have her read a poem that was inspired by, by this piece. And I'm gonna just play that. Monuments of Brown Boys. The artists install the mirror over the monument and the people have come to gawk. Rubber neckers wonder what was there before and you have come too, laying in the cut, statue still for seconds. Your reflection edging off a 20 foot high bronze looking glass. You are an alluring hunk of stone beguiling me. Yes, you, brown boy, rough cut monolith, I see you. You are a low slung jean wearing grandmother greeting pillar, an obelisk marking the entrance of your hood. You need to be somebody's memorial, not only when you laid out and lowered in the dirt, your pillow a marble headrest of past tense, he was, he once, he lived. No, you are now in present, alive and in color, and you need to be somebody's walking shrine, somebody's testament, somebody's tribute in this city. You have to be carved, stretched, and erect, a column to buttress boogeymen, the phantoms they say you imagine, the specters and goblins who told bullets and policies and laws that encase you. You need to be somebody's memento. Look how you beaming off that seeing glass. I'm catching your shine. Look at that swagger you carrying, hoodie wearing, fresh fade having, full teeth grinning. You need to be somebody's something to fight for, somebody's celebration, somebody's stone turned monument, carved and smooth, our masterpiece in this city. I still feel like that was the highlight of my career, <laughs> that poem. Um, so in 2015, I was invited to be part of a public exhibition organized by Creative Time in Central Park. And I mean, it's kind of daunting to think about that. The last piece um, in that park was um, Fristo's um, work, I think 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I decided to focus on the site of Central Park and maybe in that act, I can reveal what existed at that location perhaps allowing for reflection on kind of what stands there today and imagining also a future. So I decided to create this three flip lenticular billboard. You know, so I was reading, again, research is such a part of my practice. I was researching and reading about the Wisconsin glacier that traveled through what is now New York City 20,000 years ago. And it, you know, created valleys, it moved boulders, it formed rock outcroppings and carried debris that was eternally stranded in the new locations when the ice sheet melted. And I was interested in this physical evidence this you know, geological diaspora that can be found throughout Central Park. You know, it's both everywhere in plain sight, but also hidden by our lack of knowledge or our awareness of it. I was also interested in a more recent history of the site, the Seneca Village, which is about 10 blocks south of um, where my piece was. And the fact that you know, there's little evidence left of this once very, very vibrant um, community. This was a settlement of mostly freed African-American residents in the 1800s and they were, basically displaced and scattered wholesale throughout the city when the decision was made to create Central Park. You know, few traces of their tendency are left in, in this bucolic park. So the billboard depicted the image of a glacier, but also a party shard that was found on the site of the village. And I saw this literal and metaphoric connection between the kind of subtle residual artifacts of both the glacier and the village. The third image was a photograph of the actual landscape. So when a viewer kind of moves from one end of the billboard to the other, the glacier seems to morph into another time period. You know, it, it's as if the park goers' movements are controlling time or their understanding of it. You know, the glacier mutates into a shard from a ceramic vessel. You know, this domestic object made from clay dug from the same earth that the glacier traversed before it too vanished. This is a picture, and I always forget to credit from the New York Times, uh, but he gave me not a great review, so whatever. Um, 
So depending on, on the viewer's vantage point, kind of multiple iterations of the three images can be seen. You know, at moments, each image is distinct. At other times, they reveal themselves as fragments. You know, and I wanted the, I wanted the kind of the expansiveness of the glacier to be felt in contrast to the, the scale of the ceramic plate. Um, you know, I was hoping somehow to equate the two, you know, the massive and larger than life physicality of the glacier with the smallness and intimacy um, of a domestic object, you know, this kitchen plate, you know, so what does it mean to position these kind of two opposing scales and physicalities into the same image? And it, uh, this other thing that happened that was interesting at various distances where you, depending where you were standing, the three images seemed to overlap and became correct, co compressed, almost as though you were, com you were compressing or compressing like 20,000 years of time into a single image. So this image is, uh, uh, a 1934 New Deal era fresco by Anne Weissel Hanlon. And it's been at the center of debate and controversy at the University of Kentucky for many years, I'd say the past 30 years. You know, viewed from through contemporary eyes, you know, the fresco sanitizes history and kind of glosses over the brutality, pain and suffering that slavery imposed. It pretends, presents kind of this caricature or portrayal of a Native Americans. This is the only representation of a Native American in the fresco. You know, you have the musicians playing for the white elite. You know, boy denied access to the performance venue, but sneaking a, a view, a peek up in the tree. So in 2015, the president of the university decided to cloak the mural uh, and decided let's cloak it for two, a couple of years. And I think he was hoping to buy time for the campus community to determine what do we do now? What do we do after all the protests and, and protests were prompted, that were prompted mostly by the black students on campus? So the decision was made to commission a black female artist to make a work that could challenge, confront, and maybe jumpstart a corrective and a healing to the pain the contested mural had caused all these years. So when I did my site visit, I was, I was in, in the vestibule, I was, I was really, and the next room in is the, the, is the lobby where the, the mural is housed. I looked up and noticed the dome ceiling and I kept thinking, so the ceiling, the dome ceiling is about 16 feet wide, about 26 feet off the, off the ground. And I, I decided I just wanted to focus on that. And for me, the dome ceiling raised kind of interesting questions for me. Like why was this space designed in this way? What does it mean to create a dome ceiling in an academic building? You know, domes date back to prehistory and have, you know, ties to indigenous building traditions, Byzantine, Islamic architecture. So like what symbolism does it, does it have a building dedicated to higher education? And I think my hope was like for this kind of initial kind of recognition into the particularities of the spaces we inhabit, but then maybe lead to bigger questions. And you know, I always turn to James Baldwin and you know, his, um, his assessment about the role of art is to expose the question the answer hides. So I decided to, to gild, um, create a gilded a ceiling in the dome and insert an inserted painting reproductions of all the brown and black figures from the fresco. So I created copies of each figure, scaling them up to kind of fit proportionately um, comfortable in the, in the ceiling. Here are some images. You know, at the heart of my gesture, you know, was the act of, you know, liberating these beings, these figures from whiteness, you know, what possible reclamation or agency could be gained without the surrounding whiteness that they were previously resigned to? You know, the subjugated, you know, those deemed lowly in a sense were elevated to the divine, you know, and of course the gold leaf makes reference to Renaissance and Byzantine churches, kind of elevating them to saints. But I was also thinking about celestial beings and constellations and stars. I think my hope was for these figures in the ceiling like, to kind of reinforce the notion and possibility of rebirth definitely spiritually, but more importantly through, you know, the viewers reinvestigation, interrogation and reckoning with America's complex histories in plural. You know, this representation of these historic figures I was also thinking could maybe point to some sort of futurity of blackness. So here in, you can see an image from the fresco, a detail with this horse carriage driver, you see him resting. And, and I was trying to think in my reinterpretation how to kind of transform him. So in the, in the ceiling, it becomes almost like a dream-like space. So you have this surreal-like scene that you know hints or maybe points directly to the violence of the times as you know the resting driver descends in close proximity to the sickle of the field hand, most likely a slave working the land. 
you know, and I kept calling this group of blacks who were looking on at the train station who were denied access. Um, I began to refer to them as the witnesses, you know, both the literal and metaphoric witnesses to the atrocities and oppression of the times. And then, I, so you have this don't seal, but I feel like I needed, I wanted there to be some sort of text. So I turned to Frederick Douglass and I took a quote from his very famous 4th of July speech. Um, and I put that around the base of the base of the dome. And that quote is, um, there's not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. And I, I was conscious of the building being um, Memorial Hall. It's, it's, it's honoring Kentuckians um, who died in World War I. So I decided in the medallions to recognize, say, under-recognized Kentuckians in that space. So this is a representation of Georgia Power. She was the first African-American to serve in the Kentucky Senate. She sponsored bills prohibiting employment discrimination, um, sex and age discrimination. This represents Chief Redbird, who was a Cherokee who lived, lived among the white settlers in Clay County until his murder by two Tennessee men. The two men were never, two white men were never tried in court. Um, this is Peter Durrett, a former slave and preacher who founded First African Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. At the time of his death, it was the largest congregation of a, of a, of a church. And of course, I couldn't find any representations of Durrett in any archives. Um, you know, so I decided to portray him as a silhouetted head. And, and this was a popular way of making portraits before the invention and kind of common use of photography in the 1800s. But in a sense, you know, I was being forced to kind of present Peter Durrett as this almost anonymous figure. And it speaks, of course, to, you know, who gets to be remembered, who gets in the 1800s to be documented, to be painted, to be preserved, to be recorded, to be remembered, who gets to be in the archive. And this, uh, again, I'm using the same technique here is Charlotte Dupuy, who was an enslaved African-American woman who failed a, who filed a freedom, a freedom suit in 1829 against her master, Henry Clay, the country's, um, at the time, the country's secretary of state. So this case went to court 17 years before Dred Scott filed his more famous legal challenge to slavery. So after Clay's tenure in Washington as secretary of state, uh, when he came back, you know, she, he, he demanded that she return to his home and she, re she refused and she was jailed. You know, so this piece is called witness. And for me, it was important to have an active word. Okay, it's a noun and a verb. And I wanted the, I felt as though it had to serve the particulars of the site. You know, it's an academic institution where the piece needed to be kind of layered enough for, you know, the repeat encounters by staff, by students, by educators. Um, so the goal was to, in a way, to activate history, to keep it alive and rooted in the present tense. I think no matter how old a work is, I think, I always think about it, no matter how historic a work is, it's always contemporary because we're always thinking about it in relationship to the now, to the context of now. So, you know, my hope was for the piece to be, you know, useful, a teaching tool for the school where different departments and disciplines could possibly use it. Um, our history, religion is obvious, economics, history, African, African-American studies. And I was thinking too of, you know, the complexity, I think if I wasn't doing this piece at a university, I probably wouldn't have used gold, but I thought this is a place where gold should be used because there are various complicated and complex relationships we'd have to gold. You know, yes, it could elevate the anonymous figures to the divine, to saints, but gold leaf can also be interpreted as a literal reminder when blacks were only valued as currency, as commodity. And then you could think too of the trading and sometimes theft of gold from Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa during the, um, during the Roman Empire. So on, on June 5th, 2020, in the wake of demands um, for racial, racial justice prompted by the murder of George Floyd, the university decided, made an announcement to remove the Owen Hanlon mural. And to me, it, it just felt like a quick fix, kind of to quell the black fury and rage that was being felt from Lexington to Louisville. You know, the decision to remove the hand the mural also kind of renders my work witness, you know, blind and mute. You know, it can't exist without the past it sought to confront. You know, and it felt, felt ironic too that the decision to censor the historic wor artwork kind of in one fell swoop, swoop censored mine. And I was thinking, you know, instead of embracing the polemics of the, the two works engendered, you know, a potential thoughtful dialogue between the work of a white woman who at that time was the largest fresco made by a, a white woman. You know, and a black woman today, a seemingly kind of good deed of political correctness was 
offered up to the black members of the community who pose or hand the mural. And, it's, and I've talked to many faculty and many folks who felt as though this was the easiest thing for the president to do. All the demands for why not turn this into a memorial hall, into a, like a site for social justice? Why don't we work on raising the number of um, faculty of color? There's so many demands that people are having. This was almost in a way the easiest one to do. Um, so when that happened, um, I decided to write, I, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post, which actually I was kind of thrilled that they accepted it, you know, and in it I said, you know, witness was not created, created to magically dispel or absolve the University of Kentucky from embedded institutional white supremacy and oppression. You know, my idea is when I finished the piece, I assumed that would be the moment when the real work of the university would begin. You know, it could have been very easy to kind of create programming over time, seminars, perhaps curriculum inclusion of these works. Um, you know, I feel like a university is the perfect site or the perfect community that can kind of handle or engage kind of a, the complicated wrestling of this problematic, paradoxical and simultaneous and fragmented histories um, and how they relate to each other. You know, so it's a bit heartbreaking, you know, and it's a strange feeling too. You know, it seems that, you know, it also, renders these black and brown figures, you know, once again, anon on anonymous, you know, for a second time, you know, it was, this work was really an attempt to offer agency in, in, in a small way or some sort of autonomy for these 25 souls. But in the, in the end, that was pretty much dismissed. Um, so back in, this is a project from 2010, where um, Real Art Ways, this great art museum in Hartford, Connecticut, um, they were mounting a, a show on contemporary Caribbean art. And I decided I didn't want to do anything in the museum. I figured it's the fourth largest Caribbean community in North America. So let me just do something, something in the, with the people. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, I'm from Trinidad and I was thinking about my relationship to where I was born. I mean, I left when I was one and I spent all my summers in Trinidad and I never, never questioned my West Indian identity. You know, I still have a deep love for everything, you know, the music, the food, uh, the people. But I started to think about other signifiers of culture like books, you know, and I started to think, you know, how few titles I'd read as an adult. I was thinking about how my education was decidedly American. And I was, you know, started to wonder how deep is my tie to this place I still call home. Um, you know, I took one Caribbean literature class in college, you know, or when was the last time I kind of picked up a a book of poems by Tarek Walcott. So, so I was thinking, okay, if I'm feeling like this, maybe I could kind of use that as where I can begin. And maybe if I could create a library, that could be a remedy. You know, so I was thinking, if I feel this way, maybe other immigrants do, do as well. So I created a functioning library of exclusively Caribbean titles inside ACA Foods Market, this West Indian grocery store. So here you could see um, the books are organized, you know, the books are organized according to like region and category. So this is like jerk sauces. So that's where I put the, put the jerk sauces are with all the um, Jamaican titles. The political titles I put along the, amongst the hot pepper sauces. Uh, and, and it was a trust library. You know, no library card was needed, no specific data return. You, you know, in my head, I was thinking you were just trusted to return them when you are say finished digesting them. You know, my hope was, you know, to expand what we imagine the consumables of a market to be particularly when that marketing market is trafficking and you kind of nostalgia for home. So what would it be for this could piece to offer opportunity to kind of slow down and browse and relish, you know, the sights, the smells, but maybe also the imperishable produce, you know, of our West Indian heritage. I was also thinking about disparate economies existing alongside each other, you know, lending and borrowing, taking place at the same place where capitalism and monetary exchanges are happening. I often think about blind spots or, you know, both unseen and underused spaces. In this case, the sparse shelves um, were, were, were available. And maybe through that, through that act, it will reveal some new possibility, new opportunities. My dog's trying to get in. So here I decided to put the Trinidad titles here. And this is, no one would know this, but you know, the beginning of December, my mom starts preparing to make black cake. So you take this dried fruit and you soak it in the, in the liquor and the rum and the port wine. So I decided to put the Trinidadian titles here. Um, books, books authored by some of the smaller islands I put among the beans. That was my own personal humor. 
um, the Guyanese titles, um, children's books were among the like cookies and crackers. In the front of the store, there was a display of Haitian sodas. So I put the Haitian titles there. And I was trying to think, what do I do with cultural books that range from, you know, Mocha Jumbies to Bob Marley? And I decided maybe I should put them among these tonics, these ancient medicinal tonics um, that have been around forever, but they also, some of them have like really offensive names, like, you know, Bedroom Bully. But I was thinking it, it seemed important maybe to have in a place that, that, that we're not a monolith. How do we show kind of the range of our culture? It's kind of displayed really succinctly in, in this one um, section of the store. You know, I was thinking about, you know, poetry, maybe like kind of what new meanings or poetics could be created by the juxtaposition of book titles. You know, I, I love seeing skin folk hard dough and that kind of haptic um, sensorial experience that could happen. You know, but this is how, you know, I wanted it to function, you know, I, and I was thinking how, you know, I stalled this library in, in a community with, where I share a heritage, but it's not mine. It's not in Crown Heights where I grew up in Brooklyn, that Caribbean community. So I felt like it kind of had to, community ha had to kind of decide how long it would exist and how, what to do with it. It was no longer mine. Um, I'm gonna show something really recent. This summer, um, I participated in Documenta and I was invited, I don't know how many of you know about all the stuff this summer with the, this kind of new curating that they did for Documenta where all these collectors were invited. And then those collectives invited their people and inv kept inviting people. So this collective um, from Trinidad and Tobago called Al's Yard invited me to come to Castle. And they said, just, just come and do a gesture, come to some, contribute in some way. And I was thinking about, you know, I was really thinking about, you know, that star studded documenta from 40 years ago here, that Joseph Boy's piece, um, 7,000 Oaks. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's like, you see how those oak trees forever changed and you call marked the castle landscape. I was thinking too about, you know, Klaus, Klaus Aldenberg um, who, had, who had died, you know, a couple months prior to, to me visiting. And I was thinking about his contribution. This is pieces called, um, of his called Pickaxe. So I was thinking about that, but now I was thinking about Trinidad. And I was thinking about one of my favorite places in Trinidad It's called Brasso Seco. And this particular location is where the Pariah River um, meets the sea. So I knew I wanted to do something with these two pieces. So I created a, a poster and I'm just going to read the title. It's a little long. Um, so in parentheses, outcast, um, pickaxe by Klaus Oldenburg at Falder River, Castle, semicolon, drift, driftwood at the edge of Pariah River, Brasa Seco. And this is a quote from Jeanine, um, Jeanette Winterson that I use in the title as well. There is always a city. There is always a civilization. There is always a barbarian with a pickaxe. Sometimes you're the city, sometimes you're the civilization, but to become that city, city, that civilization, you once took a pickaxe and destroyed what you hated and what you hated is what you did not understand. So the important, the poster was important for it to kind of engage um, these two disparate locales, very specific disparate locales, Castles, Germany and, and Trinidad. And I, and I thought about, you know, this year's iteration of Documenta that was filled with mostly black and brown artists wondering kind of what its legacy would be beyond the relentless, relentless, relentless controversy coverage. Um, but it was exciting for me that, so this piece was like, we pasted on the exterior wall of Traffle House, which is one of the sites of uh, Documenta. And I love this site because it was an independent radio station, it's a multi-purpose co community space and uh, all, uh, all these amazing things happened there. So it was installed there for a week and it's simultaneously it was installed on the exterior wall of this place called Grandison Lab, um, which is a cultural center in Belmont in Trinidad. And so each week, you know, mine was only up for seven days and each week another piece went up and I, I really enjoy the temporal nature of the artwork. And it kind of reflected that kind of changing nature and use of the actual, the actual sites, both sites, the propaganda site, the Belmont site and the, the Truffle House. I also did one other project, my second project, I really wanted to collaborate with um, Trinidad's uh, famed artist and sign maker, Bruce Kenyon. And his work for like the past 30 years, he's, he's kind of impacted the visual landscape of Trinidad. Um, he's known for making these painted FET, these party advertising signs. Just gonna show you a few to get a sense. I, and you see them everywhere in Trinidad in the, in the highway and the rural roads. So I wondered, I wondered what it would do to kind of create a specific 
a very culturally specific sign for this new foreign location in Germany. So Bruce and I came up with a plan to collaborate. Like I would come up with the text and he would paint the sign. And I kept thinking of two words. I kept thinking of stopgap and foolproof. You know, foolproof meaning, you know, incapable of going wrong, infallible, never failing, um, reliable, safe, trustworthy, guaranteed, um, and stopgap, you know, a temporary solution to deal with a, a urgent problem or challenge, a improvisation, expedient, makeshift, imp provisional, impromptu, jury rigged, or last resort. So I came up with the phrase, um, stopgap, fix foolproof. And, and, and I think it was really my attempt to maybe illustrate the problematic circuit of Western reliance on bureaucratic or top-down institutional systems that dictate a universal, um, meaning singular way to conduct civil society. You know, so the signs were installed on this provisional lectern that was fabricated using milk crates by this wonderful, actually, Tunisian design collective called El Washa. So I kind of like that we just used almost like what was available. And then I decided, I knew I wanted to have the German translation. So I had two German friends help me and they said it was a bit difficult because the word fix doesn't translate the way we think of it. So they came up with this translation, which translates to the provisional repairs perfection. And that's an interesting thing because when you're in Germany, you're very much aware how the, the role of perfection in, in that society. So what does it mean that that's actually not the goal, so it did, it was amazing to kind of talk to people and see how it actually kind of, it was a, a critique, but also a, a consideration. But again, this piece was exciting about this piece is after a few days, someone took the crates, someone needed the crates, and then there was, but part of the lectern was left, the, a shopping cart, someone set it up on the shopping cart, and there's so many different iterations of the piece. And, and I assume at this point, there's no evidence remains which feels you know, about right to me. So when I was in, after grad school, I lived in Houston for a couple of years. I did a couple, I did a residency and I was teaching at the University of Houston. And I, while I was there, I won a grant um, to create a public artwork and in the third section of um, Houston, which is where Project Row Houses is. Some of you may know Rick Lowe and his, his amazing work. You know, I was thinking about that neighborhood and you know, I was aware, of, and it's not just that neighbor, many black and brown, neighborhood, you'll see, you know, advertising, negative advertising, you know, too much liquor, too many fast food joints, cigarettes. So I was thinking, you know, if I could build a billboard structure, we could decide what to advertise, we could decide what to celebrate, maybe we could just celebrate ourselves. You know, so I built the structure and I photographed a couple of uh, the guys I would see hanging out in the park, two of them I, I, I knew pretty well. Um, and I was hoping, you know, to open, you know, discourse, you know, remind each other that, you know, this is our community and we belong here as kind of gentrification was beginning. Um, you know, and I was hoping maybe to call attention to, you know, the fleeting moments, simple gestures, like the brief exchanges and that create the, the meaning of our lives. Um, for me, this is like a new kind of monument, like we can collectively decide what to celebrate, honor, revere and remember. You know, I was installing it in the middle of the night, having a hard time with the vinyl and, and it was like four in the morning, this guy comes up to me and he, he's, he says, oh, there's Al. And he, I don't know if you could, you could sort of see, he's like, he always has a smirk on his face, the guy on the left. And he said something about Will, the guy in the middle saying he always has, his eyes look, always look so sad. And then he said, oh, I got to call Will. And I thought that was like the most amazing thing. And it made me think of like why I came up with the title of this um, talk, like in the shelter of, of each other. And it made me think of um, something about that exchange with this, with this gentleman. Um, so it makes me think of this old Irish proverb that I first read in a poem um, by Padre Gatuma. And it's like, it is in the shelter of each other that the people live. So that's kind of how I, I kind of think if artwork can do some of that where we're in a good place. Um, so the idea was that it's really cheap to do vinyls. So it was gonna be a rotating billboard. So this was on unfortunately for longer than I would have liked it to be, but then it started rotating. Someone did a portrait of their family, uh, a Mexican um, community member. This is a photo of two members of the New Black Par Panther Party in Houston. This was like a PSA about, you know, food, sustainability and security. And then this happened, the Manila Museum did an ad, ad campaign and I'm not sure how they got access to this billboard structure. Maybe Project Row House who was kind of overseeing, overseeing it, figured we, let's make some money. But what was interesting that someone in the neighborhood put in an anonymous billboard, counter billboard. So in the back you're seeing a detail from a Luke Toyman's painting. And someone in the front 
but Tupac Shakur. And I think that is like the best thing ever. You know, but what I liked is that this piece is no longer, it's no longer an art piece of mine. It's the authorship is gone. And, you know, an old friend had sent me a text when all this stuff was going, people were like, who did the, the counter monument, counter billboard? And my friend's like, I can't remember, but did you do the original billboard? And I was thinking how wonderful it was that, you know, fun it's public art to me is functioning the best when people are not thinking of the author of the piece. Um, it's kind of functioning in the world as it should. Um, I think I'm gonna show one more, two more things maybe. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my Bethel project. Okay, so I'm gonna read this quote. Whereas our ancestors, not of choice, were the first successful cultivators of the wilds of America, we, their descendants, feel ourselves entitled to participate in the blessings of her luxuriant soil. So that's a quote of Richard Allen. You know, Richard Allen founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME Church, is, and it's the first independent black denomination in the United States. He also, in 1890, bought land to create Bethel Burying Ground, a black owned cemetery. And just to honor today, I'd like to honor Jane Brown, who died on November 15th in 1841 at the age of 103. She was buried at Bethel Burying Ground. During her life, she was enslaved and eventually gained her liberty. So I, I feel so honored that I've been kind of entrusted to create a memorial honoring the more than 5,000 African-Americans buried, buried at the site, buried at Bethel Burying Ground. You know, Bethel was rediscovered at the site of the Wekako Playground in, a, in South Philly in Queen Village. So when I began my research for this project, I was thinking, I was thinking of two things. I did two things. I pretty much exhausted local historian Terry Buckaloo's really impressive archive of those buried at Bethel Burying Ground. And then I started looking at aerial views of cemeteries and made this imaginary one, just like a composite of different cemeteries. And I was struck by the headstones and how they, they are the defining signifier of the land. And how, you know, at Bethel Burying Ground, only one headstone has been recovered. And it reads, Amelia Brown, 1819, aged 26 years, whosoever live and believeth in me, though we be dead, yet shall we live. And this led me to like discovering this illustration of graves in the first African Baptist Church Cemetery in Philly. And I thought about, you know, Richard Allen's, you know, kind of an amazing foresight, born, born to out of necessity in buying land to build a black cemetery. You know, the limitations were many in the 1800s. Blacks could not be buried in white churchyards and were restricted to the public potter's field. So this act of Allen's ensured dignity and death for the thousands who often endured a lack of dignity and respect in life. And I, I was so struck by the magnitude of the racism that we, we all know was embedded during their lives, but also by its echo and reach and death. You know, that little plot of land in 50 years was forced to accommodate more and more of the dead, stacked graves because, because of governmental laws and societal norms of oppression, limited access to appropriate burial sites. And of course that made me think of that knowledge of that density, you know, a result of, you know, entrenched racist policies kept leading me to these horrific illustrations that we all know and all have seen. So I was thinking about, you know, the density of the burials that existed in this cemetery. It's hard also not to think of, you know, the cramped ships of the Middle Passage, you know, Blacks were not afforded dignity of space in life or death. So during the research, you know, I was conscious of the fact that those buried were still on that land. They were still like below that playground, um, within the border of the playground. And I was thinking, what, what can I do? What would be best to honor honor them, knowing that many have stories that will never be recounted. And I thought, you know, maybe I should begin with the fact that it's still a cemetery. Um, so I researched 19th century cemetery gates, um, you know, with their grandeur and beauty and undeniable presence. And I, and I thought how they were kind of this amazing thing, these gates, because they're, they're literally a physical delineation, a threshold between the secular and the sacred. You know, they provide a barrier between like the bustle of the city or the town and the kind of serene and more pastoral grounds of eternal rest. Um, so here are some from, you know, the Philly area that probably many of you know. And though, you know, Bethel Burying Grounds boundary was originally a simple brick wall, I was interested in what it would do to the playground and its current use to transcribe this more illustrious entrance to the Burying Grounds section of the playground. So I thought it could point to the fact that to have these very two very distinct entrances, one unchanged leading to the more obvious site for play and the other completely transformed, you know, this 
new threshold would kind of signify that this is a site to revere, to honor, to gather. So they're gonna be um, engraved white granite and concrete pavers with inscriptions that reflect, you know, fragmented biographies of those hidden on the ground. And I'm thinking, you know, these will serve in for the, you know, thousands of missing headstones that normally are seen. And the inscriptions will, they're gonna be incomplete, but I'm hoping to, to, based on the text that's used, it kind of creates this impressionistic context for understanding and learning about what life was like in 19th century Philadelphia for mostly freed African-Americans who called the city home. You know, the words will reveal some of the tragedy, tragedy of racism and segregation of the time. Um, you, you see it measured in like the, the, the amount of illnesses, people dying from illnesses and disease that were ran, rampant and most devastatingly affecting the poor and the black. I'll just read one sample one that we're not gonna use. Uh, debility was cited as a cause of death for this nine week old on November 19th, 1820. It is likely that she, like 95 other children with the same annotation starved from a lack of milk. And I'm gonna use some of them will be um, humidity activated um, engraved pavers. So you'll see if, it's, if the weather's you know, sunny, it's just gonna look like a paver. And then when there's humidity or kids take some water from the spray garden, all of a sudden the inscription will be, will be seen. I was also researching, I found that for one year, this, this site after it was turned over from being a cemetery was a school garden and an educational project. So I was thinking I wanted to tie something of that in it as well. So then I thought of cradle graves, which are um, time period specific and appropriate. Um, and I was thinking about you know, these cradle graves that are you know, designed to provide a place for you know, planting flowers. And I was thinking how you know, some archeological archeolog uh, digs you know, seem to indicate that the tradition of placing flowers with the dead dates back thousands of years. And it has remained an important part of you know, funerary customs throughout the world today. So I'm hoping you know, to engage this history you know, and, and, and install these decorative planters shaped like the cradle graves and they'll be filled with um, living plants and flowers. This is an image of the archeological, one of the images from the archeological investigation and you can see the original cemetery wall. So there's gonna be a brick pathway that will allow, that will follow the known kind of footprint of the cemetery. And I thought how kind of powerful that could be. And in a sense, you know, this act is like in a, an unburying, like a, a raising of the 19th century brick cemetery wall, you know, perhaps we could become more acutely aware of the physicality of the cemetery and the physical space that it took up and occupied. You know, this clear physical demarcation, you know, the boundary where you see almost like the boundary between the living and the dead. Um, and the brick pathway, I love that it's actually gonna extend, you know, beyond the walls of the, uh, of the, of the playground. And I was thinking, how it could be kind of, I'm hoping, you know, this idea of this extension of it being literally following the actual boundary. You know, you're, it, it can act as a signifier too, a reminder that you're walking still on sacred land. You know, I think what private thoughts could be triggered say on your way home to cook dinner or to pick up your kids and be reminded of the, you know, the previous residents of your neighborhood and how they're still present and underfoot. So I, I'm also interested in the haptic experience of walking on, you know, two types of sidewalk, you know, the, the bricks and then the, and the concrete. And I'm thinking how this pathway will maybe act as some sort of palimpsest as well. So I'm hoping, you know, this memorial is gonna create this kind of restorative, regenerative, you know, educational, but even more importantly, maybe this beautiful space where descendants, neighbors, Philadelphians are offered a place to gather, to commune and to honor. So the, I'm gonna show one last thing to keep me on track. So I just had a project released, unveiled today, fresh off the presses of the New York Times. Um, a Newark, this is a crazy project because I got the commission in October and, and we had to be completed in less than a year. Um, so the, it's my largest public art commission to date and it's in Newark Airport's new Terminal A. Um, so the piece is called Approach. I'm just gonna show a couple images. So I created um, 52, 52 foot tall suspended sculptures that fill the two bays in the terminal. So they run from the arrivals, concourse, all the way up to departures. 
And, and I'm trying to capture kind of the robust tapestry of New Jersey. You know, it's iconic skylines, the industry, neighborhoods, landmarks, it's natural beauty. Um, of course, I have like chemical coasts and things that they aren't say proud of. Um, so you have these kind of slices of land and sky are suspended in these two helix-like structures. And one depicts um, daytime and the other one is, is nighttime. I really want them to be more siblings than, than the same. You know, here's a detailed view from underneath. So it's an interesting conflating and expansion thing that happens. You know, so near the ceiling, we also install, this goes back to my mirrored, mirrored monument. There's, a, there's a, a circular mirror that's the size of the, the rings. And it's kind of amazing because you see people like inverted upside down, which I, I really enjoy. But you also have, when you're looking down at these sky, images of the sky, all of a sudden now when you look in the mirror, in a way, the sky images have been returned to the sky. You know, but I was, I was hoping, you know, so you, I don't have pictures yet with people in it because it's not opening up officially to the 29th, but I just love this inversion of seeing, you know, when the workers, you know, upside down in their, in their safety green. Um, you know, so each ring is double-sided and it's presenting two distinct views. So we're looking down and you're seeing images that you see looking up. And what I like the best is that when someone is coming in on arrivals, when they look up at the sculpture, they're seeing bird's eye views. And what I like is that that's the view they would have just seen as they landed. So this view that they would have just watched down, they enter and arrive and look up and see that view. So I was hoping, you know, this inversion for me kind of echoes the temporary disorientation that tra travel often causes as we kind of transit, you know, multiple time zones and places and arrive in different places with new perceptions. I think this is a little, little, video just to give you like a little sense of the of the of the movement thank you Thank you, Karen, for this presentation. I'm super impressed with your work. I know we have a lot to talk about. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Krishana Manigan. I'm the Association for Public Arts Learning and Engagement Manager. Um, and I'm going to just get through a few questions. Um, and please feel free to put any questions um, in the Q&A box for Karen. Um, but I did have one that came through. Do you want to get from Terry? Karen Chess, do you know if your piece at the University of Kentucky is being used by any departments to teach? Um, the, I, I spoke to several of the Black faculty who were using it. And it was interesting that, that what was also strange about that, there's another New Deal era fresco in, on campus. And that one's actually called work. And there's mm -hmm. not a single image of a Black person or Brown person but there's no <laughs> protest. Of, I, I just think that's interesting. So some people have used it. Um, I am just getting ready for when they take down the mural. Of course, my piece has to go. And I'm trying to think of what I will do to make, not, not about making another art piece, but I feel like it can't be just a simple thing of like, let's scrape down the gold leaf. I have mm -hmm. to be useful for the school, for the folks who don't want it to go away. So I think mm -hmm. I want to kind of continue another way of understanding or another kind of um, conversation or some other kind of way of intervening through its, its removal. So I definitely know some faculty were definitely using it. And some students, some students have emailed me to do like, they've done like end of term video, <laughs> the film project. So it's definitely been part of it, but it's going to go away soon. We have one more, say. Oh, let's see. Okay, so this is a little bit of a long question, but a great one from Patrick. It says, I was wondering if you have put any thoughts into two Philadelphia public art pieces, which have attracted quite a bit of attraction and controversy lately. Um, the first one um, is by Simone Lee Brickhouse on Penn's campus. Um, and the second, second is a Harriet Tubman commission. 
Um, I'm particularly interested to know what your thoughts are of the academic style of the sculpture, which was originally favored, um, a style denied to most Black artists in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, Wait, which one was um, favored? Which one was? Let's see. I think he's referring to the Tubman um, as the one that was the thoughts on the academic style of the sculpture, which, which was originally officially favored a style denied to most Black artists in the 19th and early 20th century, since they were often um, a study of art. I'm trying to piece this together, Patrick. Um, but I just wanted to answer that, that just came in. Uh, uh, it, it's, this is tricky stuff. <laughs> uh, partly because, I mean, the Tubman, I, I don't know it all fully, but it seems as though, as though when it was temporary, people loved it. Mm. <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't, this is tough, you yeah. know? And the Simone, I, I don't know what's the controversy with the Simone Lee. I remember that in New York, that problem with the, that commission with the, for the Marion Sims, the reimagining the Marion, the, Mar the taking down, I think there was that issue where the Art Advisor Council loved it and the community was like, no, we want the other one. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a funny balance. I mean, I remember thinking about the Diner Project, you know, I was very much aware that the community was going to decide that project, but I also had to, I'm sorry, I'm not answering the question, but I had to trust that it's an intelligent audience. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust that if I pay attention to the site, I'm going to serve different constituents. So like in that piece of Dinah, it's like, there's going to be school trips. I got to be able to engage school children. How do I, and I'm sorry, I didn't have time to show that piece, but that those questions that I asked that are gonna be part of that memorial, they were questions that will keep changing over time your answer. Or if you're a kid on a school trip, you answer that question, it's gonna be different than as an adult. I kept thinking if you work there, the context of that place would allow that piece to keep expanding. So I feel as though on one level, it's, it's more about is the work, I'm curious what the controversy is with the, so, oh, so for me, I, I, I thought all three proposals worked for the Dinah. Um, I think it helped that I spent a lot of time in the park, like in Stenton Park. Like I, I knew that park. You know, so um, so I, I don't know if it gave me a leg up, but I, I spent time watching the kids play football. I hung out there. I spent the time. So even if I didn't get the commission, I knew that I've kind of, kind of tried to get as much as I can in that little window they give you to come up with your proposal. And the fact that I kind of have a sense of, N nice town area in Germantown it kind of allowed me something. I don't, I feel like I wouldn't be comfortable. I mean, I felt like I had a hard time even thinking that the Newark project, I was having a hard time with Newark because mm -hmm. my work relies on, my public work relies on people not having to get it all in one go. If you get it all in one go for me, for me, it's less interesting. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that Pistorius, you know, is three, I, I live on Pistorius Street, by the way, but Pistorius is a couple blocks away. Like I knew people were gonna see it over and over. So I knew I had to do a piece that could kind of keep on giving that you don't get it all in one go. Right. So I felt as though if I could just do my research, be invested as much as I can, I'm getting ready to go to Tampa tomorrow to do a memorial African-American burial ground that's been uncovered there and working upon, but I'm gonna to have to do some trips. I can't just mm -hmm. go in there and like, first of all, I'm not gonna do what I did at Bethel. I'm not gonna do Dinah. <laughs> I, you know, I have to do news. So I have to spend the time with, Yes, the meetings and all those are scheduled, but I just have to hang. So, mm -hmm. so I could feel at least confident when what I present, even with the battles joined, you know, when I was installing, I had a guy who was like, this piece, I bet you it was $25,000. I'm like, you're close. It was 28. Mm -hmm. how, can, how can you, how can you rebuild that when people are starving right there? I was like, I know people are starving because I re live right over there. But the fact that we end up sitting down and talking for hours and he became the biggest supporter of that piece. And I'm like, why, do, why can't we have beauty? Why can't mm -hmm. we have beauty? Because mm -hmm. we have poverty, we can't see ourselves as beautiful. So I think for me, it's like, how do I, how do I just trust the audience? Trust that there's enough context that's gonna be engaging 
for them that I'm allowing them, like really the work, I think for me, when I'm thinking about art, even at the airport where I'm like, oh no, it's like, it has to be spectacle. It's like, it's challenging the piece. Like these images don't do anything. It's, it's, it's like, it's crazy. Like it's conflating. Is it moving? It's like, no, it's static. It's keeping you engaged and allowing a space for you to see everything because seeing everything at once is almost too much. Mm. The gate. And yeah. is there a theme that you find within your work that you may come back to of having the environment reflected back to the viewer? Because it seems like that kind of plays as a theme. And um, I think it's your... partly being a twin. Like I never thought. I think it's partly being a twin, maybe. <laughs> um, but I think about the mirror. It's a thing. Like we, I mean, we could talk about Lacan and the fragment itself. You know, like we're never fully whole. Oh, like like we're fragmented. I mean, that's the wrong term, but we're or we have multiple identities. Like we're not a single thing. Our identities are constantly expanding. At times they feel like they're contracting. Mm -hmm. So for me, I forgot your question. I'm sorry, I can go off on a tangent. No, you're fine. I basically just said, I think that there's a theme that I find within your yeah. work with the environment. So I think about like that, like we're constantly, like we're more than, we're both more than who we are. We're both unknown to ourselves. And I think I, maybe it's like, because my background's not art and it's psychology, that thing of like that that waking up and seeing what is is known, but now, damn, I'm upside down, or damn, I didn't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or the fact that I like that thing where attention, or how could the work be a catalyst in many ways? Can it be a catalyst for us to commune? Is can it be another way of communicating? Because it's the the object is is engaging. It's a situation that object, not not an object. My hope mm -hmm. we're creating a thing, and I think. The reflection, yes, it could be a mirror, but it could also be other things. But I do realize that has been coming in lately. Um, yeah, but I think, which is a funny thing too, because I think, is it partly what this work is partly doing well because we are in a somewhat a narcissistic scrolling <laughs> where people like to see themselves and I worry about that, but I can't worry too much about that because if the work is strong or if the work is allowing, is, is assuming an intelligent audience is not just going to be about taking my selfie. Right. If, if you're trusting your audience, is going approaching your work is tr trusting the audience that mm -hmm. we're this year. Oh, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. Um, I can keep going. I have many questions. I know there's a lot of questions that are still in the chat too, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, Penny, I didn't know if you had any. I last actually, questions. I have sort of a comment and a and a question. You said something that uh, really stuck in my mind. Uh, and you said that there are stories that are hidden because of our lack of knowledge. And I, I see your storytelling as being such an important part of your work, whether it's in person, because I was at your presentation for Dinah. And though the work itself can stand on its own and does, the way in which you communicated it to that audience, I think really made a difference because you respected it. And, and you know, you just said the intelligence of the audience so that with that narration, I think that's another way of-, of That's a part. I should say, yeah. heart, you know, the heart thing, you know, I got teary eyed when I was reading, like, do you feel free for that presentation? I literally got teary eyed. Mm -hmm. And I remember in another, when I, after I got the commission and I had a community manager who actually died um, um, during COVID, um, what was her last name? Valerie, oh, I forgot her name. She said, I, I feel like you're missing one of the, one of the questions you haven't included. You need this question in it. She's like, one of the questions should be that you asked Dino, um, do you wish you had let it burn? And I was like, how did I not even think of the most obvious question and how complicated? Okay, I'm now, they freed me. I was a slave, now I'm free. But these damn W's, Dwight's, you know? Yeah. So I was like, that is, that's, that's again, how, how many times do we all feel, you know? as a person of color, as me queer, as a woman, as 
you know, but then at the same time, I have a white who's a, a, a wife who's white, mm -hmm. but I have my mother, you know what I mean? Like it's complicated. It's like, give us space and room to, you know, it's like, also, I think with that piece, there's a this space for gentleness. This this space. There's um there's a I, I hope with the work there's the silence, and that's part of that same poem. That silence allows space for you, you know, because you're mm -hmm. it's not silent. You're feeling it being in your head, being in your heart. So let that, you know. Oh, our art is hard. It's hard to make it art. <laughs> it's hard. Because <laughs> I say all these things, but who knows? Some people at, at Newark Airport might be just like, this is cool. I'm just taking the pictures. Well, I'm like, it is cool. But I'm hoping you thinking about how strange it is, like the gift of flying, but also like the strangest, but also the trepidation of it, but also the, the this, this constant moving that we're at, you know? What did it mean back in the day when you took four months to be on a ship to get somewhere? Like, so what does it mean? So this yeah, exciting, but it's also like, that, that 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 disorientation is beautiful but it's also could be debilitating you know it, you know it, it looks of course not seeing it in person is you know a, a detriment but when i saw it i thought it was all mirrored because i know your other piece and so i kept trying to figure out how those images wound up being mirrored it was like magic Someone else asked me that you're saying is it mirrored <laughs> me it's doing this weird like your eye your head your body yep. like, well yeah. and there's the tease with the one mirror mm -hmm. so you know you have to kind of there's a lot to figure out if you've got a moment in your travels right. and that's the thing it's like it has the spectacle quick shot but it's also like wait what can i do i kind of run upstairs and see what that thing is that i can't see make out you know so we'll see Hopefully. Well, this was great. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Karen. We'll have to send in some of these questions and hopefully maybe we can get your response to them. Um, love that. Um, but we'll we'll keep a hold of these. And questions. I like when people ask hard questions. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I don't like me think my practice. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good ones in there. There's some good ones. We'll have to come back to them. Um, again, I want to thank you for your time. We look forward to you know staying up to date on all your projects. And please let people know too where we can find out just staying up to date your website. Okay. Um, my website? Yes. You need you need my website? Yeah, if you can just say it. Oh, put oh put it in the chat. Or you can say, put it in the chat no, or you can my just... name, KarenOlivier.com, but Karen with a Y. There it and is. Karen Olivier with an E. I don't know what you'll get. <laughs> you might get something better. Who knows? No. <laughs> no. But please thank send those questions because I'd love to see them. I will. I will. I want to thank our audience members for joining us and sending in questions. Um, our next speaker series will take place in December um, on Tuesday, December 6th with Hamza Walker. He's the director of LAX Art, and we're excited to talk to him as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Have a good thank night, you. everyone. Take care. Bye.